Welcome. You are already familiar with the general concept of a function. A function can be seen as a machine that transforms an input to an output. For example, the function square takes the input 3 to the output 3 squared equals 9. Let's review the terminology related to functions. Recall that the set of possible inputs is called the domain of the function, whereas the outputs should be elements of the codomain. In the example square, both the domain and the codomain are equal to the set of real numbers. To emphasize this, we write f from r to r. If we once again take our input 3, the corresponding output 9 is called the image of 3. We can say 3 has image 9, or 3 is mapped to 9. Notice that not all elements of the codomain are reached as images by the function square. For example, the element minus 1 is not reached by the function square, since a square can never be negative. The set of all actual outcomes of a function is called its range. In our example, the range of f is the half-open interval 0 to infinity. Notice that the range is a subset of the codomain, but, as in our example, it does not have to be the entire codomain. In principle, the domain and codomain can be any set you can think of. For instance, in the next example, both the inputs and the outputs are vectors. The following function f maps the vector x, y to the vector x squared plus y squared, comma, x minus y, comma, x squared. The inputs are vectors with two components, so the domain is equal to R2. The codomain, on the other hand, is equal to R3. In this example, the image of the vector 1, 2, for instance, is equal to the vector 5, minus 1, 1. So a vector function maps a vector to another vector. This might remind you of the matrix vector multiplication you have learned. Can we regard that as a function? Of course we can. Let's call this 2 by 3 matrix A. Matrix vector multiplication allows us to multiply A and a vector x, y, z in R3. The outcome will be a vector in R2. Therefore, we can define a function t of x equals a of x, which sends the input vector x to the output vector a times x. We can now say that the image of the vector 3, 2, 1 under t is equal to a times 3, 2, 1, which equals 14, 8. A function that can be written in this way is called a matrix transformation. As t has input vectors in R3, the domain of our matrix transformation is equal to R3. Notice, this 3 was exactly the number of columns in our matrix. The output of t consists of vectors in R2. Therefore, t will have codomain R2. This corresponds to the number of rows of the matrix A. What about the range of the function t? To find the range, we need to figure out all possible outcomes of the function t. Let's take another careful look at what t does to a general vector x in R3. As you learned, the outcome a times x is a linear combination of the columns of a. If we use all possible input vectors x, we see that the outputs give us all possible linear combinations of the columns of a. Together, they form the span of the columns of a. So, for a matrix transformation t using the matrix a, the domain is equal to r3, where 3 is the number of columns of a. The codomain is r2, as a has two rows. And finally, the range of t is given by the span of the columns of a. Now that we know about matrix transformations, we can use the language of functions to describe concepts you deal with in linear algebra. For example, I will ask you to find all vectors x in R3 with image equal to 1, 1. Since t of x is equal to a times x, this just comes down to solving the linear system a times x equals 1, 1. Our very first basic linear algebra problem. So please, remember how to make this translation between the language of functions and the language of systems of linear equations. In class, you'll see many examples of matrix transformations and their special properties. For example, did you know that you can regard the shadows of those trees 
as the image of a matrix transformation on the trees themselves, or that rotations are also matrix transformations? See you in class.